Good morning to you, brothers and sisters, and uh, we want to thank God this morning for allowing us to uh, leave the service and to uh, share the word of God with you. Um, <clears throat> let us pray. Let us come together to listen to God's voice, to listen to each other and to speak what is on our hearts, to be held and heard, to find our voices and to hear God's call. Lord, sometimes we find it hard, very hard to accept what your word is saying to us. As we gather here today, you help us to understand the difficult bits and learn from them too. May God bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let us pray. For all the times we doubt you, the times we doubt your answer to your prayers, because we do not see miracles, the times we see only what we want to. For the times we listen only to the people who agree with us, and the times we listen to anyone but you, forgive us, Lord, for those things. For the times when we do not speak when we should, and the times when we speak when we should remain silent, forgive us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I would call my brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God from the book of Luke chapter 4. Verses 21 to 30. Okay. All for you, brother. Thank you, Johnson, and praise God that I'm here this week to be able to read the Word of God to you. It's uh, just such an, uh, an incredible honour. Uh, my heart goes out to all those with COVID and with family that are sick and possibly even dying. So uh, keep looking towards the Lord in this, this time. And... Uh, yeah, put your trust in him. Uh, Johnson mentioned we will be reading from Luke chapter 4, 21 to 30. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that come from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah, Elisha, the prophet, yet no one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this, they got up, drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Praise God. It's going to be an interesting uh, sermon by Johnson, so we better get him back and get into it. Thank you, Johnson. <coughs> Uh, greetings to you all, brothers and sisters, once again. And uh, I've decided to share with you on the theme, uh, when the sermon turns sour, what it means when you are preaching and your preaching turns sour and uh, uh, something uh, you unpredictable happens because you thought you are preaching the word of God and then people react in a different way. This is what happened with Jesus when he was preaching to them. And you would see, you need to move together with me and you see what was growing up, what was coming up, uh, all these things happening. And uh, it's, it's hard to impart joy, joy to those who dwell gladly and gainful in sorrow. Ever notice that I'm not talking about the truly sad or those who are grieving. I'm not talking about those suffering from depression or anxiety. These are truly debilitating um, conditions. Some people, however, neither respond to joy nor comfort because they are gaining too much power, too much attention, too much satisfaction, or compassion in remaining unhappy. 
angry, miserable, or spiteful. Especially when they feel they are justified. Especially when they feel jealous. No matter how much you do for them, it will never be enough. No matter how you try to console them, you can never do it. No matter how much love you give them, you feel like you're throwing that love into a black, dark, never-ending void that can never be filled because they never accept who you are. These people appear to be perpetually inconsolable, unquenchable, unpeaceable. People who simply cannot do or will not feel joy no matter how they are with or what they encounter. They are receiving two main perks remaining exactly as they are. Sometimes the benefits these people are reaping are clear to us. Sometimes they aren't. But you know, when you are in their presence because their souls feel like a vacuum, sucking the life out of everyone who dares to come to close to them, their energy is like a dark cloud that envelops the entire room. They exude negativism. It's just negative. I'm sure all of you have encountered someone like this at your time in your life. Where you feel in the presence of someone and you feel that, no, I don't think I need to be here. Stay in their presence too long and you can actually begin to feel exhausted, depleted. Often you sense them from afar and know that to stay far, far away. Anyone engaged in public speaking, if you, have, you know what you can sense, the mood or the spirit of the room, you feel those who spew joy and encouragement your way. Likewise, you can also send someone who emits negative energy, jealous and anger when you are with them, when you are talking with them. But you keep on speaking, hoping somehow you can reach everyone. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you simply can't. So here, Jesus knew this as well. He was the master teacher. At the beginning of his ministry, as we see him today, he is traveling from synagogue to synagogue, preaching the word of God, speaking and teaching all the scriptures. He is gaining notoriety and is being praised by everyone. Luke makes sure to tell us that. So it is even more impactful that when Jesus arrives at his hometown in Nazareth, things don't go the way they do everyone else. Initially, things are as they usually are. Jesus gets up, reads the scroll, and sits down to teach as he does everywhere else. Then, like Ezra the priest before him, Jesus prophesies, today this scripture has been fulfilled as you've heard it. This is what he's saying. At first the crowd would begin writhing about him, impressed by his words. He is prophesying jubilee. This is awesome. It's time to part. This is great. No more foreigners. No more Rome. Listen to our boy. This is our boy. Listen what he said. He is saying great things. This is Joseph's son. Our guy. He is going to make things good for us. Yeah. This is Jesus. You see? And then he drops the bomb. And then he drops the bomb. I can just imagine the sudden silence that must have filled the whole room. One moment people are laughing, smiling, praising joyfully. The next, their eyes widen in shock. What did he just say? Their anger rose to the surface and quickly bubbled over. In Nazareth, a sermon turned sour. It started out sounding as familiar and comforting. And then Jesus raised the question, how far is God's reach? It was and still is a troubling issue. To think that the reach of God might far extend to our own. To consider that the kind of people with whom God might choose to associate is different from our list. That is disturbing. Did he just diss us? His own people. Dissing his own people. His own family. So God isn't blessing us. His chosen ones. But blessing Gentiles. He's now talking about Syrophoenician woman. He's talking about Naaman. He's talking about all these people. He's not going to spend his time healing us. Blessing us. Ministering to us, taking care of us. We are to be cast aside so he can spend his time with Syrians, with Phoenicians, and Romans, and foreigners, sinners, and oppressors, and outsiders, Nani Jews, and prisoners. That is what now he's talking about. What is he talking about? This guy, he's lost his sense. 
He could do this to us. He betrayed us. He is dishonored. He is disrespected. He is downright just insulted us. Did he just say he doesn't feel welcome after all we have done to him? Did he just imply that we aren't worth of God's blessings? And others, we are not good enough for him. This man, what is he doing? We are not worthy enough for God? What an ungrateful, arrogant comment. And to think we are praising him and supporting him all this time. Who does he think he is anyway? He's one of us and he's betrayed his own people. Look at this man. What is he doing? And after the shock came the anger. The loud voices shouting, pushing. This is in disapproval. This anger, a lot of anger, a lot of rage. Nazareth was angry, all right. Angry enough to run their golden boy out of town. Wanted to throw him right at the cliff. Angry enough to try to throw him off the cliff. That's a level of anger that goes beyond rubbed the wrong way. However, honor is huge, as you know, in Middle East even today. It was no different back then. Jesus just dishonored his own people, his own family, and his Jewish heritage. Angry didn't begin to describe what they felt and the revenge that rose from the core of their self-righteous spirits. It says dark clouds indeed. This was a storm like no other storm to these people. It is, in, it is clear in Luke's scripture, and Luke makes sure we realize this, that Jesus has just deliberately provoked this backlash. He poked the beer, so to speak. Why? Here is where Jesus' personality, the one we saw forming already when he was 12 years old, comes rapidly in focus. He is not interested in being liked like today's people. Who want to see the likes on social media? How many likes do I have? He is not interested in that. He is interested in proclaiming God's mission. He is the two-edged sword. This means provoking the wrath of anyone not on board with God's universal grace. He is provoking intentionally. Jesus, the divine judge, is already here. And is on fire. Jesus' mission, God's mission, he's doing the work of God, has never been up for approval. If you are doing God's work, you don't wait for people to approve what you're saying. Say the word of God, no matter how it provokes the people. God doesn't get on board with our likes and demands. No, 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 no. It's not about the likes, it's about the word of God. We got on board with God's mission. From the beginning of time, this has been a source of grapes. The tragedy of Cain and Abel, Jonah and the Ninevites, Elijah and the widow of Zerapath, Elisha and the healing of Naaman the Syrian. God will bless and heal whoever God chooses. It's not a particular people, it's not a particular nation. God will bless and even heal whoever he chooses, whatever we like it or not. Whether we like it or not, that is what God does. And for those of us who believe we are more righteous than most, the answer is usually not. God has always loved every person who, created, who was created by God. So we, however, have always wanted God's blessing for ourselves. Or at least not for those we disapprove. We don't want them to be blessed by God. So God's gift of mercy and grace given to those whom we feel don't deserve it has plagued our souls from the time of independence from the garden. And today is no difference. Think about Jesus' parable of the vineyard workers. It's no fair that those working one hour get paid the same as working eight hours. It's contrary to the way we think. It's against our norms. Think about Jesus' experience of anointing Mary. It's not fair that all that money gets poured over the head of one man. We could have used that for something more beneficial. Think we don't do the same. It's not fair that people lead our committees when they only join the church today. They become leaders. And we are talking about to say, these people just came yesterday in the church. We've been here more than 50 years, and now they're leading the church. It's not fair. Yes, it's not fair, but it's fair to God. It's not fair that God blesses those whom we create living in sin, sporting bad theology that we don't even approve of. Surely that isn't the case. 
It's not right that God would possibly condone the lives of those people. Surely our judgment in this regard are scriptural, are sound. God couldn't have possibly meant that. God's mess and salvation is for people like us, not people like them. It's not for those people. Whenever you feel that self-righteous bond rising up in your body, remember Nazareth. Remember what happened in Nazareth. For God's proclamation is one of celebration, but it comes with a distinct warning. It's for all people, not for single people. It's for everyone, the Gentiles too. So Jesus, Messiah, the Lord, Son of God, proclaim of divine mission, keeps God's original blessing to Abraham close to his heart. You are blessed to be a blessing. That is what he's telling people. In other words of the prophet Isaiah, you are blessed to be a blessing. In Genesis 12, verse 2 to 3, and Isaiah 42, verse 1 to 6 and, uh, um, and 7. Here's my servant, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on, on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who are sitting in darkness. This is what God is saying. What is your mission here on earth? as a Christian. What is your mission? What is your mission? I think my mission and your mission is to share God's covenant with all others, with everyone else, to be a light to, for those outside your walls, to be the light to those outside this building, to be your light to those outside your, 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 your fellowship group, because you are the light of the world, to open their eyes to God's mercy and grace, to free them from the prison of their doubt and fear, to release them from the darkness of their hopelessness, and to grant them God and your peace. You are the person who God has called. You are the person who God has called. You are the light for the world. You are the soul for the world. So the mission God has called you is that you become the beacon, the light that shares in darkness for those people, not only among your own groups, among your fellow people, but outside. Brothers and sisters, I would want to end up by saying, do what God has called you to do. Do you really remember when God called you? And what did he say? Are you still doing what God has called you to do? When Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he is saying, this is what God has called me to do. And is proclaiming the divine message that God has called you to do. When he called the first disciples, he called them and he said, I would want you to become fishers of men. So the call was direct, fishers of men. Are we doing what God has called us to do? Do we go out with love? Do we go out as the light of the world so that people know who we are? May God's peace and goodness be with you even if you share God's peace and goodness with others. People should see Jesus in you. They should see Jesus Christ manifesting in you. They should see through the power of the Holy Spirit that you are being led by the Holy Spirit. And when you preach the word of God, even those who hate you, they will not do anything. As the Bible says, you walked through them. You walk, they tried to throw him into the cliff, but you walked through them. Whether that was a miracle, I don't know, but he walked through them. He is untouchable. You can't do anything to him. Nobody can do anything to you when you preach the word of God. May the good Lord bless you as you continue to share his word, as you continue to remain faithful to your call. God be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you that sometimes we do certain things without even knowing. My Lord and my God, you are our refuge. A, a safe space to escape from danger. You are our righteousness. You speak truth into our lives. You are rock, the ground on which we build our lives. 
You are rescuer, making haste to help us. We believe that you have protected us from birth. You have done great things for us. Whose love never ends. Receive our thanks and praise. Receive us, Father. Help us. Guide us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I would urge you to continue supporting us. As we know, we are living in difficult times. Without your support, otherwise we will close the doors of our ministry. But we continue to move on because you also support. You are doing your part. Thank you for realizing that you always wanted to say, thank you, God, after hearing the message of God. So it's time for you to give your thanksgiving offering so that I will pray for it. Let us pray for our giving. Father, we bring our offering before you. Bless this offering, Father, so that it could be used for the expansion of your kingdom. There are people who are waiting to hear word. There are people who are waiting to hear what you say. Father, we pray that you continue, Lord, to bless our offerings as we give it to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. May we receive closing prayer and uh, benediction. Lord, we come before you. Lord, we remember that one day when our lives come to an end, how will our worthiness be measured? Let us be remembered for life-changing hope in the now and not yet kingdom of God. Let us be remembered for sharing grateful thanks for all that has been and all that is to come. Let us be remembered for love, patience, kindness, and forbearance, endurance, and truth. As we long to be nothing but a reflection of the faith, hope, and love that we receive from you, our God. You are saying in God's name, we will not be afraid. We shall speak to nations and kingdoms. We are the prophets of the nations. We shall go out with joy. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters, as you continue to preach the word of God. Do not be afraid. Sometimes the sermon can get sour, like what happened in Nazareth. God bless you. Amen.